world, many problems can be too complex to be solved by a single machine, by a single machine learning model. Whether that be predicting sales for each individual store, building a predictive maintenance model for thousands of oil wells, or tailoring an experience to individual users. This, this leads to a pattern of many models. When should you use this approach and what are some of the best practices or things to avoid if you decide to go down this route? I wonder, well, to tell us everything they know about it, we have with us Maria Medina and Hossein Alizade from Microsoft. Welcome, Maria, Hossein. How are you? Thank you, Elena. Good, thank We're lovely, you. glad to be here. Lovely to see you. So we're looking forward to all your secrets, to finding out all your secrets. Remember, we're in the attic and the attic is the place of the hidden treasure. So all yours, mm -hmm. Maria. <laughs> okay, yeah, so let's talk about the many models pattern or how to manage uh, thousands of, of models uh, at, at a scale all at once. Um, yeah, so as Elena said, I'm, I'm Maria Medina. I work as a data, science in, in data scientist in Microsoft Consulting Services. I'm based uh, in Madrid, in Spain. And together with me, uh, we have Dr. Hossein Elizabeth, who is, uh, who's also a, a data science in, a data scientist in Microsoft Consulting Services. And he's based in Melbourne, Australia. So he's joining us from the other side of the world today. Um, so in the following 30 minutes, we're going to talk about this many models pattern and why uh, the need of it. We're going to talk a bit also about Azure Machine Learning, which is the tool that we're going to be using for, for uh, developing all this solution. Um, we're going to talk about how to train uh, those thousands of models and how to make predictions with them. And then uh, we'll end up explaining how to operationalize uh, everything and a bit of wrap up. So with that, I'll pass, on, I'll pass it on to Hossein, who will start explaining us why many models. Thank you, uh, Maria, and uh, I'm also very glad to be here uh, today um, sharing what uh, Maria and I have learned um, through helping um, our, our customers uh, building, um, building many models for their uh, to address solutions, uh, complex problems. So uh, yeah, why, why many models? Um, as you know, um, as some of you might might already have seen this um, slide, um, the organizations can be um, different in terms of uh, where they are in their data and AI, and AI maturity um, a journey. Some uh, might only have some basic analytical capabilities. Um, some might be embarking on their digitization and some further up in this ladder. Um, the more organizations get, um, get further up in this, in this ladder, the more, um, and the, the more they are uh, matured in this, um, in their data and AI journey, um, we see at Microsoft more and more um, a need for um, an, an, an emerging pattern for many models um, uh, solution. Um, so um, instead of just uh, just uh, training um, only one model um, um, or, or inferencing from one model, we see a, a pattern um, where there is a need for uh, for uh, for uh, doing um, and, and managing the full life cycle of machine learning models on um, on a scale, um, including training um, of thousands of models at the same time in parallel, forecasting of that um, in terms of auto um, um, and drift detection, and also in terms of uh, productionization of this um, of this. As an example. Um, uh, one of our customers, uh, which is a 100-year-old Australian uh, utility company, um, um, they have reached out to us uh, with, their, uh, with their problem. Um, they are pretty mature in their, in their AI um, um, journey. They, are, they already have a sizable center of excellence for advanced analytics. Um, so, so their the requirement they have is also very advanced. Um, what they uh, come up with in terms of the problem 
they had a uh, forecasting problem for the uh, for their solar uh, production and and load from the grid for every households among their customers. Um, the, uh, the the solution they they required. Um, had to be scalable um, enough to, to leverage all of their, their customer base, which is around 400 thousands of households. So this is um, a perfect example of, of that requirement where you want, where you need to build thousands of models like a scale um, and, and create a solution that is scalable. Um, and, and being able to manage the life cycle of the full solution on, at a scale. Uh, but this is not the only um, the only example. We have observed um, a variety of industries and um, organizations that share similar requirement to train and manage life cycle of thousands of machine learning models. That um, um, whether it is a bank. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, which has a um, cash replenishment um, um, models for for thousands of their ATM machines, or it's a retail business which has thousands or even hundreds of thousands models for their price optimizations, um, and and want to manage that um, that um, that that whole solution um, in a proper manner. Um, or it's a it's a energy and utility that 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 has um, 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 demand forecasting problem at a scale. They all again share the same pattern of problem and requirements that uh, that requires a solution, a proper solution. And uh, what we came up um, at Microsoft in terms of the solution is uh, what we call it as many model solution accelerator. This solution accelerator is addressing that problem. We um, at Microsoft, we open source this, pro this uh, solution accelerator and, and everyone can access that in um, through MS um, slash many models we, we we publicly shared that so that um, every we um, so that we we empower every organization in the planet to to achieve more in terms of um, in terms of their their AI capabilities but what is this uh, solution um, um, what are those components or the main components in this solution? How they work and, and how different bits and pieces in this uh, full solution uh, work there to achieve this, this goal? Uh, we are going to, um, in the, uh, for the rest of this, um, this talk, we are going to, to uh, unbox this solution and, and talk through each components one, um, one by one. And, and and share uh, how we can actually. But before going through that, first we need to um, to to define and and to go through some of the uh, key concepts and components in Azure Machine Machine Learning um, um, for those who may not be um, aware or may not be familiar with that. Um, so that we can take it from there. So with that, I, I would like to, to um, ask Mario to, um, to, um, to take us to the introduction learning, please. Thank you, Hussein. Yeah, so um, Asian Machine Learning, or AML in short, as we call it, uh, it's a tool that helps you manage the life cycle of your machine learning applications, the end-to-end -end life cycle. So it's not meant to replace any of your machine learning code. Instead of that, it's meant to assist you during the process of executing the code, storing all the results and metrics that the code produce, produces, and also help you putting that code into production. Um, so, for example, when you're training uh, a model, it can help you uh, by tracking all the experiments that you make, all the metrics that you produce, all the artifacts that you produce, and um, when when you have uh, built some successful models, you can also package the, those models and version them so they're like ready for uh, for like being potential candidates to be put into production. Kind of like your favorite uh, model list. Um, it, it also has some features and capabilities to help you validate those models and understand, interpret 
what those models are, are doing um, on the inside and why they are making the, the predictions they're making. It has a wide variety of, of functionality to help you deploy these models and use them for making predictions in, in real life, in production ready environments. And also it has features to help you monitor the models and detect if the data that you're using uh, is drifting or if the model itself is drifting, and then you might need to retrain it and start the process all over again, closing the cycle. So when you create an AML um, service in, in the Azure cloud, where you're creating in, in the cloud is what is called a workspace, an AML workspace. Uh, so that is essentially like a folder for your project when you, uh, where you will store all your artifacts or your uh, data, your models, your experiments, and everything like uh, very tracked and um, with versions so you can keep track on everything you're doing and never lose anything that you're doing in your machine learning uh, system. And for interacting with this workspace, you can use uh, uh, the main two tools are the Python package and the R package, but you also have some other tools depending on, on the language you're using for building your models. And one very special artifact that you can create with AML are the pipelines. So these pipelines are used for defining workflows in your machine learning applications. Um, this is a good way to encapsulate your machine learning logic so it's more repeatable and, and reproducible and, and modular, right? So um, a pipeline is essentially like a sequence of uh, tasks that you're going to perform. Uh, raw data is going to come from one of the sites and uh, the result of a training pipeline, for example, you would have a train model. So inside the pipeline, yes, as we mentioned, we will have a, a sequence of steps. And again, this is not meant to replace your to replace your scikit learn pipelines, for example. Instead, this is like a layer of abstraction above this to make the code more manageable. manageable. So, for example, in a training process, you would have a step for uh, data preprocessing uh, at high level. Then you will have one step or several steps for doing your training with different algorithms, different configurations, and so on. And you might have a final step for evaluating all those uh, training results and uh, choosing which is the best performing model and registering it into your workspace. And we have very different types of, of steps. So there are steps for running Python core or code or R code or uh, specialized in hyperparameter tuning, for example. Uh, but in our case, we're going to be using a very uh, special type of step, which is the parallel run step. This is a step that allows you to run a task in parallel many, uh, many times, as many times as you need. Um, so what you are going to be using is uh, you're going to provide uh, a script, which is going to be defining uh, the task that you want to perform over a set of data, and you're going to input a whole data set. And then parallel run step automatically is going to split that data set in mini batches. You can configure how you want to do that, that splitting. It's going to split everything process these mini batches in parallel by executing the task that you define in the script that will produce some output and that output will be aggregated uh, again automatically and the, the output of the parallel run step will be this aggregated data set with the final result of applying this task in parallel to all your mini batches. Um, so this is uh, the structure that we are going to use uh, in, in this solution accelerator for many models for training and also batch uh, forecasting. And so uh, I'll pass it to, to Hussein, who will explain you how exactly we're going to do this. Uh, let's have a look further in detail on the training side of the machine learning of the many model solution. So, so um, on, on the training side, we um, all we need to do is, is providing to the many model solution with some scripts uh, for the training um, of, of one of those uh, for one data. Then we have the many model solution. Uh, which which actually uh, takes that that full um, and takes that data and that script and and run it in um, in in parallel um, um, and 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 provide the results uh, which are basically the models 
um, and, and register them in the model registry. But how it, it does that? So let's look at the, the under the hood, what's going on. So uh, if you look at the right hand side, you see that up there, there are um, a data and also a train script provided. So they are provided to the many models solution. And uh, the core of many model solution is that parallel run step. So the, the job of parallel run step is to take the data, break the data down to very small pieces, and then um, and then pass that those each one of those uh, pieces along with the train script to the um, to the uh, the different nodes within a cluster. So you see down there, there is a cluster. Each node within that cluster um, is is taking one piece of that data with the training script and and uh, run an um, algorithm um, um, on, on that data and train that and and the results will be saved in in the um, azure machine uh, azure model registry um, and this is done on in parallel on on all of the nodes in the cluster um, you you um, uh, may want to provide your custom script for training um, a custom model, or if if um, you don't want to, uh, there is an option in in Azure in many model solution where you can choose to leverage uh, AutoML, and and that is also included there. So you, um, so AutoML can can automatically um, test um, through many of machine learning algorithms. Um, and give you the best results out of those experimentations. So this is basically the, the, the training side of, um, of the uh, solution. And, and when it is done, it provides um, the, all the models in the model registry. So you'll see that uh, all of the models, when they are finished, the model registry, uh, and you can um, keep track of them. You can see the version, you can, um, you can um, see what experiment they have been um, 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 result of and, and so on. Um, next, please. Yeah. So uh, for our specific use case in the in the site level forecasting, we had um, we have had 1,500 households for the first phase of our our solution implementation. Um, each one of those households had basically three models underneath. Uh, solar production AC was a time series to be forecasted. Then solar production DC was another one. And then consumer usage, which is basically the load from the grid. So overall, we had um, uh, three times 1,500. Overall, we had 4,500 models uh, to be um, a train to be forecasted and to be productionized. Uh, for the um, for the training script, we have had a custom script that were training a neural network based uh, forecasting model. Um, for implementation, we leveraged many model solution accelerator and and specifically the parallel run step to train all of those uh, 4,500 models in parallel. There was also a requirement from the from the customer to um, um, to leverage the real time thing with a single API. But how we can how we can do that? Let's um, let's have a look further into the foresight. What is the the forecasting capability in the um, many model solution? So generally, we have two types of forecasting. One is batch inferencing or batch forecasting or batch um, prediction, and the other is real-time uh, forecasting. On the batch forecasting, it's it's pretty much straightforward. It is um, 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 you have a pipeline and you want to, um, on, on a schedule based, uh, you want to pr uh, periodically generate the predictions for all of your data and, and save it in a storage. And uh, so this can happen on a, every day or every week or every hour, whichever that suits the best for the business, you can uh, schedule that. 
on the real time in France, however, you need to, uh, you want to have some web services that are up and running 24 seven and, and they are always um, uh, ready for, for prediction for whatever data that you provide to them. Um, so they are um, always ready uh, upon request. So they are basically uh, more um, resource um, heavy compared to, to the batch inference. Let's look at each one of them in more detail. For the batch forecasting, it's pretty much very, very similar, the, the, the architecture to the, um, to the um, uh, batch training. As you see again on the, on the top right hand side, you see your data and your prediction script. You provide that to the uh, many models. You provide that to the specifically the parallel run step parallel run step, again, distribute that, distribute that against um, the cluster, um, and every node within that cluster takes that takes a, a one a subset of that data with the predict script, and then apply um, the, the model, retrieve the model from model registry, apply that, that model on this, um, on this part of the data, and, and provide the, the forecast and, and return the the prediction. Um, it, it may save it in a, in a storage uh, or wherever is is appropriate. But on the <clears throat> but on the real time are a bit different. You want to deploy them on web services. You want to deploy your models on web services. So so uh, let's assume that you have one thousand web uh, one thousand models in your model um, registry. So you want to take each model with the uh, predict script and deploy that on a web service. Therefore, you will have 1,000 web services for, uh, for taking the 1,000 models uh, deployed. And each one of them will provide you a, an API um, or a link where the user, the end user can call that model through that API. With this approach, you will have, you will deploy 1,000 web services and provide 1,000 endpoints to end user. Um, but that is not a, a, an ideal approach because it is um, not using the, um, the, 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 the resources uh, well. Um, um, the, uh, the 1,000 web services are very costly, and and you don't uh, and and most of them will be idle most of the time. Therefore, we want to come up with a solution that that uh, optimize the the resourcing and the resource management. Therefore, if we go to the next slide. Um, therefore, we um, we have um, a package three um, um, groups of models into a web service um, that, that that's possible. Um, let's assume that our web services are, um, are, are big enough to contain 100 models there. If so, we go with, with groups of 100. So uh, we, we, we package all of the model, uh, all of the, 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 the 100 models with, along with the, the training script into deploy them into one uh, web service. And then um, we do the another 100 and another 100. So in this approach, you will have only 10 web service for your 1,000 models. And, um, and each web service provide you with an API. So you will have, end up with 10 points. And then user um, need, to, um, need to call them. That's, that's much better than the first approach. However, there is still an issue, and that is the end user does not want uh, the headache to go through the, the, uh, the understanding of which model is uh, deployed in which web service. They just want one API so that they can just call that API all the time. To address that um, requirement, we came up with a two-layer structure, where on the right-hand side, you see the routing web service. 
So, um, so we have here in this web service, we have deployed a router. What is this router? This router is nothing more than a dictionary where it, it, serve, it saves and the model one and model two up to model 100, they are, um, they are saved or they are deployed in, in um, uh, web service number one. And so and and so on, like model 901 and 902, uh, they are deployed in, in web service number 10. So it this router knows where each model is deployed. So this this router also uh, because it is a web service, it also has an API. So we provide that API to the end user. So end user. Uh, provide the data and call this this single endpoint and this um, this routing web service the, its job is is only to call the the appropriate the, the associated uh, web service that that has the, the the relevant model inside um, apply that get the results back and provide the results back to the end user so with this approach you will deploy 11 web services and provide only one endpoint which is the, the best case for the, for our end user and solve that, that single um, API issue. This is um, the same approach that we have leveraged for our use case um, um, as well. And, um, um, and, and with that, uh, we are going to see how we are, are, um, are going to Product, uh, productionize this solution. So, um, so Mario, can you uh, please take us through that productionization phase? Sure, thank you. So, um, yeah, you probably have seen this figure before. Uh, this shows how little our actual machine learning code is compared to the other uh, many parts of, of our machine learning system. So in our particular case, uh, the machine learning code, this little black, black box here, it's only uh, the training uh, code that we're going to provide, the training script with these uh, modules or whatever, and the predicting script that we were using either for batch forecasting or for real-time forecasting. All the rest, um, the, machine, the Azure machine learning pipelines and all the uh, infrastructure needed to uh, connect everything to do the data cleaning, all of that is part of uh, our machine learning system uh, but it's not machine learning code. But still, of course, we need to make sure uh, that uh, we follow the best practices for uh, productionizing this uh, for a, in development and also operations. So we're talking, of course, about DevOps uh, practices. Uh, this is a very broad area. Uh, so uh, we'll just focus on uh, six uh, six practices to to summarize uh, we're going to see yeah, of course we're going to use version control we're going to use uh, we're using continuous integration pipelines and continuous delivery pipelines on the infrastructure uh, infrastructure side we're going to leverage infrastructure as code and use microservices to make everything like uh, more interconnected and easy to use and of course, we're going to be monitoring and logging everything that happens in the system to make sure that everything is working properly. And if not, uh, to yeah, get an alarm and be, in, be able to fix it quickly. But in our case, we're not talking about traditional uh, software systems. We're talking about machine learning systems. And we need to adapt this. So now we're talking about MLOps practices, not DevOps. And what are the differences in this? Uh, well, first uh, about versioning. So version control exists uh, because uh, we need to find a way to control everything that uh, is going to influence uh, the, the behavior of our, of our system. And in this case, in machine learning systems, it's not only the code that determines the behavior of the system. It's also the, the models that have been trained and give predictions, right? And ultimately, the data that has been used to uh, train those models. So all of that needs to be uh, controlled. Uh, the versions need to be controlled. So of course, we'll use uh, Git uh, for uh, controlling the, uh, the version of, of the code. And we can use a tool such as Azure Machine Learning to uh, versioning the data uh, and, and the models and make sure that everything is tracked. Uh, and about continuous integration. So continuous integration is having the capability to, from, from our code in our version control system, 
build uh, the code and make it ready for uh, to be used whenever we need uh, to use it. So in our case, having a machine learning system ready to be used means having a model trained and ready to give predictions whenever we need to, right? So our continuous integration pipeline is going to consist of the training of the model. Then uh, we have continuous delivery. In this case, where we are delivering our model predictions. So what we're going to do in continuous delivery is deploying these models. There's not much change uh, needed on the infrastructure side, but of course, uh, we're going to be uh, leveraging infrastructure as code, for example, when running uh, trainings uh, remotely. So we have uh, the, the nature of the course that we, the clusters we're going to be use uh, remotely for, for training. We have that configured as code. So we can replicate all these nodes and with all the uh, environment that we need as many times as we want uh, to run this uh, training in, in parallel. And then, uh, of course, we're using services in the cloud with these microservices uh, approach. And then on the monitoring and logging side, uh, we also have a big difference here because uh, our system, um, the code might be working perfectly and the model might be giving predictions. So everything looks uh, fine on that side, but model predictions might be not accurate enough. And that also means that the system is failing. So and we just uh, we don't need just to uh, monitor the code, but we also need to monitor the data that is coming to the system and how the model is, is working. And we need to place this uh, yeah, drift, uh, drift monitoring in place to be able to, for example, retrain and we see that the model is not performing as we expected. And for building these uh, continuous integration, continuous uh, the, uh, deployment pipelines that we mentioned, we normally use Azure DevOps, which uh, uh, has many capabilities for uh, handling all these practices. So a continuous integration pipeline uh, would look like something like this. Uh, from changes on the code would trigger the pipeline, which would essentially, as we uh, mentioned before, uh, launch the training, evaluate all the models, register the best one, and then that best model that uh, is registered will be published as like as a as a result of the of the pipeline as an artifact, and then that artifact will trigger the continuous deployment pipeline, which will essentially put this model into production. So uh, the typical way of doing this is uh, deploying the, the model in different uh, stages. So we start with the development environment, and we might uh, be wanting to try deploying the model in, in successive uh, environments uh, until we eventually deploy it in, in production. And what we normally do is we set a manual approval gate uh, before deploying into production, because data science processes are also uh, very influenced by business. So it's not just a technical, a quantitative decision whether to deploy a model or not. You also have to take into consideration some uh, qualitative uh, things that will, can come from, from business, from, for example. So this is like the whole architecture, how everything would uh, look like. We will first have a setup pipeline, then we have the train pipeline, then we have the deploy pipeline, and then we have this monitoring in place that eventually can make us retrain the whole process again. And this is how these pipelines look uh, in our use case in, in many models. So we have this setup pipeline to deploy the infrastructure and do the, uh, the setup of the data and the environment. Then we have the modeling. For simplicity, we have combined these two. So first we do uh, the we update the data that we're going to use for training. We run the model training and then Right away, we deploy these models uh, into into different uh, uh, Azure uh, resources for deploying web services, uh, and this is optional. Of course, you can skip it if you don't want to do real time uh, deployment. And in that case, you will run the batch inferences pipe pipelines. So for example, you might run a training pipeline once a month to train your models, but you might want to run the batch inference pipeline once a day to make uh, daily predictions. And this is essentially the same, updating the data and then running the pipeline to issue the, the forecasts. Uh, but in a real uh, life use case, apart from having all these pipelines, we start uh, from, from the beginning with experimentation. So data science is at the end of the day, it's a science, right? So it has a lot of component of trial and error and experimentation. Uh, so you need to start with that part, then eventually you will move on 
to uh, developing uh, the, the components that are going to be part of your DevOps and MLOps pipelines. And then you will have, of course, your, your monitoring system in place that could uh, retrigger some trainings to see, land the CI uh, pipeline if something is not, if, if it's not going uh, well. Or you might need to uh, even go back to the experimentation phase, uh, phase to, for example, uh, try with different uh, new features that will make your model perform better. But this is, yeah, uh, an ongoing cycle that never ends because at the end, uh, we're talking about a uh, product here. Uh, no, we're not longer talking about projects that have a, an, 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 an initial phase and an end. We're talking of a, an ongoing cycle that uh, never ends and always improves. And with that, I will pass it on to Hussein to do a bit of wrap up of what we learned in this session. Thank you, Maria. So uh, we have so far discussed um, and unboxed basically uh, the many model solution accelerator, the different um, components and parts within that, especially the training prediction and prediction side of it. We also saw how we have leveraged the many models to solve and to address the business problem that we had uh, with, with our customer, with Microsoft's customers. Um, um, so, uh, please. so we also um, leverage the, the productionization and, and how we have productionized that solution um, into the, the, the customer's environment. Uh, but that was basically mainly around the technical side of the, of the operationalization. Um, what is still remaining um, and, and is also very important to, to note is that um, the, the business always um, on the operationalization side care about, cares about the orchestration of the capabilities um, and the tools and processes to successfully drive business outcome. Um, they uh, and, and like productionization from from business point of view is all about adopting change, um, which which drives the organization's success. So um, we at Microsoft we are very glad that uh, the solution that uh, we helped our customer to implement um, has been uh, delivered and and received with great success. There has been um, great um, testimonies from the from the customer on that, and and you can read more on this use case um, uh, with aka.ms many models use case. Um, so uh, that that solution is already in their live production, and they are using that on their day to day basis. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank you, everyone, um, who um, stayed with us um, in the last 35 minutes, 40 minutes, and uh, and we are happy to take on any question. Well, thank you both, thank you. Maria and Hossein, especially Hossein, because I didn't realize that obviously he's in Australia, so it's what, four o'clock in the morning for you? <laughs> My it is God. four uh, four uh, or nine. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't look, you look uh, fresh as a lettuce. Lovely and so nobody could tell, but <laughs> it is true. <laughs> Poor thing, it's four o'clock in the morning. So I'm not sure if you want to take the question, so we'll let Maria do it. Uh, we have time for a couple of quick questions, if you're okay with that. Um, they're asking you about security okay. and um, uh, can uh, AML access possible sensitive data on premises and how to tackle this? Um, yeah, uh, so uh, what uh, we normally do with Azure Machine Learning uh, is that uh, we have uh, some connections. So uh, for from the for the data science the data scientist that is using Azure Machine Learning is transparent, but uh, what it does is setting up some uh, like virtual connections to uh, some uh, resources that are uh, in the cloud. So. Um, Normally, all this data is located uh, in, in the Azure cloud of the customer, and you can set some, of course, uh, a lot of uh, permissions in place to uh, make sure that anyone and nobody that isn't allowed to access it can access. So what we normally do, uh, in fact, is 
uh, with these uh, pipelines um, organization, we have like a, a pipelines user, which is not, not, not a real user. And the pipeline user is the only one that has access to the production data. And then the, the data scientists, for example, are uh, testing with uh, a subset of data that might be masked, but they don't have access to production data if they don't need to. Okay, so every, everything has been thought about. Of course, <laughs> well, I was sure about it, but they ask, we have to, we have to uh, double check. Um, just That's a quick true. one, if you, if you can, Hossein, now that you're awake, I don't know if it, it's a terrible time, four o'clock in the morning, because you don't know if you should go back to bed or there's no point, but it's, it's too early, so <laughs> you're gonna hate us <laughs> for, just for 24 hours. Tomorrow, you'll be fine. Okay. Um, just, just quickly on AML as well, what are the prerequisites uh, of the solution and the aut automa automation of the solution? I guess this is a yeah, long answer, guess, but if you could just quickly, no. Sure. So um, I guess uh, from the from the prerequisites of leveraging mini model solution, you basically um, uh, requires the access uh, to, to to Azure machine learning environment and a workspace. Um, so it's not really. Um, um, so if you think about that, um, that um, uh, you may need like advanced uh, to be very advanced to be able to leverage this solution. Um, I, I think uh, that is already taken care of, and this um, this solution accelerator is is uh, pretty much um, ready and, and easy to use for for a person if if they want to to leverage this. Uh, for the productionization, also we have. Um, we have many uh, components already built in within the system. Uh, Maria has, has worked herself. She has worked um, um, extensively on, on, the production, on the productionization pipelines of this solution. So it is um, very well um, ready for, for um, everyone who, who wants to use that. As, she, as you said, there's a, it's been a successful solution so far. Your customers are happy. So I guess you just encourage our viewers and uh, the audience to, to use it. And if they have any questions, mm -hmm. just to let you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. always room, free to always room for to improvement. You have. Yeah, but uh, we have no time for more, but it was uh, lovely having you both, Maria and Hossein. Uh, this is one of the great things about technology that we didn't have to fly you in, <laughs> but uh, you had to wake up at four or at five or, uh, sorry, at three prob probably or at two, I don't know. But it was lovely to have you all the way from Australia and obviously Maria as well, she's, uh, she's uh, closer to us. And uh, we hope to see you very soon. So uh, next year, maybe in Madrid, Hossein. Maria from Microsoft, yeah, thank sure. you both so much for yeah, this for fantastic sure. in-depth explanation and congratulations for such a great job. It looks fantastic. Thank you very much. Stay around in the attic yes. for, our next, uh, for our next keynote speakers, uh, our keynote, uh, which will come in just, in just a few minutes. So stay around, go in the platform. Remember, we have a hashtag BigTH20. Go in the platform and don't forget to, to check on your next keynote. Uh, in order to ask questions to our coming speakers. See you in a minute. Bye-bye.